Milt, we're live. Awesome. Facebook. Awesome. First time. Facebook Live. I'm excited. Yes, I'm excited as well. We get to take a break from our daily grind, so to speak, and yes. get to catch up. It's been forever. I mean, we were students at Clemson together, <laughs> know, right? A long time ago. A long time <laughs> yes, ago. Yes, a long time ago. We can reminisce about yeah. those days yeah. all day long, yeah. right? Uh, but I, I would have to say, I don't know now, am I going to be on the couch or are you on the couch? I think I'm on the couch. <laughs> I, I think, you know, uh, it's easier to tell people what to do instead of doing it. So that's that's sometimes fun to sit on the side. But I guess I'm on the couch right now. Yes, you are. So yeah. this is going to be a new experience Good. for you, yes. right? Yeah. Yes. So now I'm going to be analyzing you. Mm-hmm. How often, though, do – seriously, do, do people – feel intimidated if they're talking with you. You know, I think that's a point. You know, I just see myself as Milt. Most people call me Milt. Um, but I am aware of that people think I'm always observing, always analyzing. Uh, with that, you you worry that it becomes a judgment or a critique. Uh, you know, I, I love Kathleen Swinney. I think she's like, hey, Milt, you know, like, <laughs> like hey, are you, are you analyzing me? And I love her sweet spirit. And I'm like, no, this is just Milt. Right, I can I can engage and cut that off, and I think the benefit of my job is you just get to see the good and the bad of people, and you realize how alike we are, and so uh, I can walk in that path very easily because I know my own struggles and my own failures, and just connect with people in a real way. But I do think people sometimes. They get a little uncomfortable. I imagine they do. Yeah. Am yeah. I being psychoanalyzed right now? It, that's right. And I know that's obviously not your intent and yeah, that's no, just not no. what you do. I mean, but you you have the skill set to be able to help and uh, you know, from a professional standpoint. Yes. But as you mentioned, we all have our stories. Yeah. We all have these journeys and however they're intertwined in, you know, dysfunction, non dysfunction, whatever it is, we all have those. Um, and that's why I'm honored that we get to talk about your journey, your story, yeah, right? It's a funny story. I do I, I will say as you like the best perk of my job is getting to know people's stories and yeah. find out kind of who made them who they are and what they believe and and how the good and the bad times have shaped their perspective and developed resilience and instilled hope. Uh, and so I appreciate the chance to be here. Of course. Now, have you always been uh, somewhat, you know, or had this gravitational pull to understand people's stories? Or did that come later on in life that you really appreciated that? I think I've, uh, I think naturally maybe I was born uh, in, in a parental influence um, with a set of empathy and emotion for people. Uh, in fact, my father-in-law sat at my rehearsal dinner and said, Milton and Caroline have a unique relationship when they get in a fight, she goes outside and cuts the grass, and he goes upstairs and cries. <laughs> <laughs> and so I was, I mean, I remember I read a book in the sixth grade, and I finished the book in a class, and the man's father dies at the end of the book. And I read that, and I just start, I just start tearing up. And so uh, always been somewhat emotional, always yeah. been caring about people. Uh, being comfortable with that, growing up on a cotton farm in Sumter, louder men really didn't cry. Uh, they were really that's tough. right. And so learned you to had say, to be tough, right? I, yeah, I'm still tough, um, but to being able to balance that and appreciate that. So that's that's I think I've always had that. Um, so it's neat to see I think how God has worked to use that hopefully for good. Yeah. What's the last movie you cried in? Last movie I cried. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> I'm an emotional guy I, yeah, as well. I yeah. can I can cry <laughs> at a moment's Man, I notice. Can, yeah, I, I don't know. Um, if it was a tearjerker, I cried. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we watched The Star is Born, and I probably was tearing up just a little bit at the end of that. Yeah, it's amazing how I can wear my emotions on my sleeve mm-hmm. as well, especially on that side of things where I – because it's the stories and just how – It seems like a lot of times I relate it back to my own story or something that I've been through, you know, um, and that's what makes me emotional from that side of things. Well, I think Alfred Adler talked about empathy being defined as seeing with their eyes, hearing with their ears, and feeling with their heart. And so trying to be able to connect with someone in such a way where you can see it through their eyes, you can hear it through their ears, and feel it in their heart— I think that's how you really create an emotional connection, uh, that you aren't taking ownership of their story, but you're with them in the story. That's an emotional connection without a doubt. And I am so disappointed I did not have a pen, paper to write down all these things that you're already throwing out. Uh, (laughs) Uh, Because I love those type of uh, aspects of learning and and hearing, you know, the the wisdom uh, from that standpoint. But going back to stories and personal journeys— Let's talk yours and how sports 
intertwined into your journey? What was life growing up outside of, you know, you're working on the farm, yeah. right? But yeah. how you gravitated towards sports? Well, my father played baseball for Clemson. Uh, 1958, 1959, Bill Wilhelm's first couple of years, they went to Omaha. And I grew up, I have a brother who's four years older, a sister who's two years older, and a younger brother who's 10 years younger than me. And so growing up on the farm, my brother and I played one-on-one everything, <laughs> championship of the world. Like whatever, of course, like, yes. wiffle ball, basketball, baseball. And I really knew three things growing up. I really knew um, farming. I knew medicine because my older brother knew at a young age he wanted to be a physician, and I knew sports. And so sports became kind of the fabric and foundation of what I did and how to compete and how to get better and and resilience and teamwork. And so it's been a part of my life uh, forever. What was your first love? Sports wise. Oh, man, I love them all. So I played basketball, football, and baseball, and it was so hard for me to always choose. I guess basketball was maybe my first love. Yeah. Uh, my father uh, tried to make me a right handed hitter, and so I was frustrated with baseball because I would get on the right side and my hands, and he'd make me switch <laughs> my hands. And, yes. and finally, I got to the left side. I was like, oh, you're a natural lefty. And so basketball, I remember five years old out there playing bitty basketball, couldn't tie my shoes. They have to call a timeout for my mom to tie my shoes. <laughs> Um, but you could you could play some ball though. Yeah. Uh, well, my older brother just he was four years older than me, and I always thought I should be able to compete with him. Yeah. So did you guys have knockdown dragouts? Oh, big battles, big battles. Um, and he never let me win. You know, you had of to. Of course earn not. It. Uh, no, big brother's to not going to do that. Yeah. And so a lot of those one on one games and challenges, um, building some confidence. Hey, if I can play with him, I can play. Yeah. Well, I remember. At Clemson, in the quad, <laughs> <laughs> the fraternities getting together, and man, it was competition. Now we were competing uh, fraternities, oh, yes. right? Oh yeah, uh, Those but we had some battles out there. Great battles, great memories. I spent so much time. I always laugh how much farther, or quicker my queer career would have progressed if I'd have spent as much time in the library <laughs> as I did exactly. playing ball. Well, as you and I were catching up and talking earlier, I mean. There were times I would skip class. Oh, yeah. And I probably shouldn't tell my parents that, right? Yeah. But, uh, we're okay now. Yeah, I, I, I guess, yeah, the statute of limitations, right? But I would skip class to continue to play basketball oh, absolutely. out in the quad, especially when it was a nice day. Oh, when day. it was sunny, I was done. Like at 12 o'clock, you'd hear that ball bounce, and I'm like, yeah, I'm not going to my afternoon classes. And it was something special. Now, I don't think it's the same necessarily at Clemson. Life moves on, things evolve, and it just doesn't seem like the quad is – the same type of atmosphere as it no, once was. No, they've, they've kind of changed it, but that's probably, you know, you kind of remember things as better when you were there. Of course. And our, and our memories are a little bit skewed. Yes. But we there were some great memories and great relationships. And what I loved is you weren't in like your own little group. We got to meet different people and compete in different ways. Yeah. And I think men especially connect by doing things. And so that quad became representative. Hey, we connect by playing ball. That's right. Or intramural sports, whatever that was. I still have those fond memories, and I still have those connections. Yes. Uh, as long term, I mean, some of the my best friends in the world were developed through those years and those days out there in the quad. Oh yeah. You know, in the fraternity. Did you always know you wanted to go to Clemson? Yes, I applied to one school. That was I, it. Yeah, that was it. I, um, <laughs> what was the backup plan? I, I, no. I didn't have a backup plan. <laughs> I remember I was playing baseball spring of my junior year, and the Walford baseball coach came down, and I had to catch that night. And just had a had a good game, and and he started trying to recruit me, and he offered me a little bit of money, and I just was like, man, I appreciate it, but I'm good. I'm gonna go to Clemson. It's not happening. Uh, the Citadel. I actually talked to them about trying to play some baseball, and I, I think the Citadel would have been really good for me, but I'm like, yeah, I'm not doing that. So. No, why would Citadel be good for you? <laughs> I could have used a little bit. I was held back in the eighth grade. My parents told me I was immature and irresponsible, and they were right. And so um, probably the Citadel could have uh, helped you mature yes, a little bit. Yes. Now, yeah. so, I mean, was there one particular incident, or was there a chain of events that happened that your parents felt that— Well, my dad said, Milt, if you stay back, you're going to get so much bigger and stronger for sports. And and your your audience can't see it, but that really never happened. Like I, I keep waiting to get bigger and taller. That never materialized. <laughs> but I think you know I, I was a I was a decent student. I just wasn't focused, and just just not that I got in big trouble. You know, I just had a rough semester and yeah. um, was not staying focused on my studies. And and they thought I needed a little bit of help to grow up and 
some consequences for my actions. Yeah. Now, were you a younger child? No, no, no I was no, an April. Just, yeah, yeah. It just, was, it just was pure immaturity or responsible. <laughs> uh, so do you think it helped? Yeah, I think, you know, it was tough to kind of make that transition yeah. to a small school and uh, to see people. Yeah, because everybody had to notice that oh, oh, you there, didn't there advance. No doubt they noticed. And um, I look back, I don't even think about it, but all the experiences and all the things I've been through have helped to shape me and make me who I am, but also help me understand when somebody else is struggling. And I think one of the young things or the pressures we put on this young generation is to bloom early and to be great at everything. Mm-hmm. And and so it helps me encourage parents. It helps me see it with my own children. And it helps me understand my own stories, man. I, I, you know, I was, I was a good student. I was a good kid. I, I made okay grades or good grades. Um, but it's okay to kind of face some consequences because that's how you grow and that's how you learn. Of course. So sometimes the adversity shapes you more than the success. Absolutely. And so what about you from a parenting side of things? Because, uh, you know, I'm always fascinated because we're in the parenting roles that we are now. Each of us have three kids and they're, you know, teenagers and growing up. But it's a challenge. So how have you dealt with that challenge, what you're talking about in terms of, hey, take your time. It, things don't happen yeah. overnight. Yeah. I just try to really, uh, we talk about defining success as just a pursuit of a worthy goal. And and for me professionally, whether that's helping Clemson trying to win, whether it's graduating our players, whether it's helping them leave equipped with the tools for life, whether it's working with a leader who's trying to be great at home and great at whatever those worthy goals are. And so I try to instill that in my children as well. Hey, what are your dreams? My job as a dad, I think, is to help you strive for your dreams, uh, to keep pursuing those dreams and not set a limit, but also to help them suffer consequences. And so uh, my job is to encourage them to define success the way we see it versus letting the world dictate or set a limit on what they can do or what they can't do. And And, Go ahead. And how hard is it, though, for you to allow them to experience failure? Because as a parent, you, you want to protect them at times, right? You want to give them, at least I know from my side, I want to be able to give my kids a better upbringing than I, than I had. Uh, you know, I come from a dysfunctional family background, never knew my biological father. And, wow. uh, you know, so those type of challenges. So that's where I struggle. Yeah. How do I allow them to be exposed to certain things, but also give them a better life? Well, I think what we try to do is rob them of the very things that make us who we are. And so when we try to shield them from life lessons, that we take away the things that help make you who you are and me who I am. When you think about Coach Swinney and what he went through, that's made him who he is. That's right. Hunter Renfro this morning, we had him just kind of not being recruited and having to earn everything. And so to me as a parent and as a leader, it's understanding the difference between self-efficacy and self-esteem. Self-efficacy is I believe I have what it takes to be successful. And, and that's something that you own, and that's something that you believe in. Self-esteem is kind of do I like who I am. And so a lot of these misguided approaches we have as parents and maybe other leaders in this generation are, hey, let's build their self-esteem. Let's don't grade in red ink. Like everybody gets a trophy. Yeah. And that they know the difference. And so we try to let our children build that self-efficacy instead of their self-esteem. Okay. And I teach a parenting class called God Does Not Care If Your Children Like You. Because my mother used to always say, when I get to heaven, God is not going to say to Milt like you. God's going to say, did you do what you thought was best for Milt? And so it's not about being their friend. That's right. It's about leading them, and that comes with accountability. It does, uh, for sure. And so when you look back as you talk about dreams and all that, what were your dreams? Oh man, I like <laughs> my, I, I thought I could play baseball at Clemson. You know, that was it. That was a dream. But I never, I, I just guess, always had a sense of what life was going to look like. But I never really crystallized or formalized it until I became older. Like I was going to go to Clemson. I was going to play baseball. I was going to be a physician. You know, I dated a girl in high school for five years. We were going to get married at the age of 20. Like, like I had life planned out. <laughs> you had that, it all ready to go. planned out that way. Uh, and then life threw some curveballs that I was unprepared for and, and kind of had to step back, gain a different perspective, and then start clarifying some vision of what I really wanted. What were life. those curveballs? Yeah. So my junior year of high school, 
I'm leaving a baseball game and heading home, take a left turn out of my high school, come away up on a four-way stop sign. It was a two-way stop sign at the time, and there's a car in the ditch, just my mother's car, and someone had run a stop sign. First person on the scene, I run over to her car. You were the first, first person. First person. Yeah, first person. I get out my car, and I sprint over, and she's in the front seat lying down, and had broken her back, her neck, her pelvis. Blood was everywhere. My little brother was in the back seat. Uh, eight years old, no seatbelt, and thankfully he was fine. And so she recovered, but I was unprepared for that. You know, we say all the time, it's hard to prepare for what you can't predict. Of course. And so I couldn't drive by that spot for about six months. Um, my summer consisted of I would wake up and go to work. I'd come home and try to take care of her for a couple of hours and then play American Legion baseball as our shortstop. And she had a halo in her head, and she would sit behind home plate like this, and, and I couldn't make the throw to first base. And I never equated me going through the trauma of that experience with not being able to make the throw. So you talk about losing confidence of course. and self-efficacy. And so kind of had that experience. And so, to, yeah, so you couldn't make the throw because, I mean, you're well, dealing with the visions of your mom and then you're seeing her with the halo in the stands. Yeah, and but I never made the connection. Yeah. I just, you know, I just was struggling. I had Steve Sachs. And, you know, if I had time to think about it, I had no idea where it was going. And so go to football camp that year, I break my arm, I miss the first three games as our quarterback, um, kind of graduate, try to walk on at Clemson in baseball, that didn't work. Come back from Clemson and my parents separated and divorced after 27 years. Come back to Clemson and one of my really good friends gets in a car wreck and uh, his friend in the wreck uh, uh, died in that wreck. And, and then the wheels kind of started coming off. I had been kind of a yes sir, no sir, yes ma'am, no ma'am. I was a biological science major, um, started taking organic chemistry, worked with my brother on his cadaver. He was in med school, and I'm like, I'm, like, I'm done with this. Not, not for I'm, you. Yeah, I'm done. I'm done. <laughs> I don't even like blood. Yeah. So I switched my major without much thought into agriculture. Like I said, I knew sports, farming. I knew medicine, and farming. So sports didn't work out. Medicine's not going to work out. I just know farming. So I switched my major over to ag mechanization and business my sophomore year at Clemson. And so my degree from Clemson is in ag, mech, and business. Um, That's a little different than psychology. <laughs> yeah, a, a lot different. <laughs> but during that, I was really angry and really upset. And did you know that you were angry during I think that time? I, I think people knew that I was angry and hurt, but I don't know why. Like, I couldn't yeah. – I didn't know how to deal with it. And so, uh, you know, got away from a little bit of what I believed, got away from acting according to – uh, consistent with who I was and what I believed. Not didn't do anything crazy, but became not a great student. Um, had a had a good time. Mm -hmm. Were you uh, selfish? Yeah. Oh yeah, I think I definitely was. Broke up with my girlfriend, just struggling in life. And my mom called and said, "Hey, you need to go see a psychologist." And I wish this would be the point of the story. I went and changed my life, and <laughs> that inspired me. But I said, "No, those people are weird. I'm I'm not going." Yeah. Like, I think, psych like, that's awkward. I'm not, I don't need to go talk to anybody. I'm not going to go sit on somebody's couch. And so I tried to figure it out myself. And, and I was, I've been blessed with good friends my whole life and people that have taken me in and loved me and cared about me and supported me. And uh, some of those people are still my best friends today and family people. And so, you know, kind of narrowed the story a little bit, went to Clemson, graduated, went home back to Sumter, started working on the family farm and started coaching basketball at my high school. And I know you said you were coaching basketball as well in college and just really realized, well, I love the outdoors. I love the farm. I love seeing the finished product that you put together. There was something about working with people and motivating people and helping people accomplish things and become people like they didn't even think they could. Like when I think about the definition of a coach, it's transporting someone from where they are to where they want to go to where they don't even think they can go. And so I just realized there was something about that that was And you enjoyed me. that. Yeah, I loved it. I loved the idea of trying to put a team together and motivate them to work together to achieve a worthy goal. Why didn't you continue coaching? Well, that uh, – so <laughs> I had a dream then. Okay, you know, I'm a coach at Clemson. Yeah. And so I had – That was my dream yeah. one day too. <laughs> <laughs> and so Rick Barnes was at Clemson. And I reached out to him through some mutual friends, was working on either becoming a manager like you were or a GA just to get my foot in the door. I applied to grad school and got accepted, and I'm going to Clemson. I think I'm going to go help Rick Barnes. So around June of 96, he calls me and says, hey, Milt, I got some bad news. I don't have a spot for you. 
Good luck. Hang, I'll hang up the phone. And so I'm like, well, what now? If I can't get in the door at Clemson, I don't know how to get in the door anywhere else. Yeah, you didn't think you had a shot anywhere yeah. else. Yeah, and so for high school, I, for some reason, I just thought I wanted to be in college. And so my mother finally called and said, hey, I really want you to go see the psychologist in Columbia. He really helps people figure out life and career decisions. Why don't you go meet with him? So I went and met with him, and two hours later, I walk out of there and I'm like, I think I want to do what he does. I want to I want to further my education. I want to help other people, and I want to work for myself. What was it about that meeting then? It just such a powerful moment to have somebody be fully focused on you, and in a very non-judgmental, respectful way, take your thoughts, look at them, let you process them. And I thought, you know, I really think with what I believe my gifts are, and my strengths are, and my passions are to really provide hope and comfort and healing to people was really what I felt compelled to do. And also I'm an impulsive decision maker. So <laughs> Sounds like yeah, it. I was like, okay, I'm in. I had no idea how long it would take. I had no idea what it would look like. But yeah, you I, had no plan. No plan. But I, like, this is what I'm going to do. This is why I'm going to do it. And, and if I ever want to get back to coaching basketball, I'll do that on the side. And so as Nitschke said, he who has a why – can suffer almost anyhow. And so once that came to life, then I was just figuring out, okay, how can I make this happen? And did you figure out your why pretty quickly? No, I think it still crystallizes, but it, but that foundation is never left. I love to learn. So I constantly want to learn and I really want to help people uh, grow. And I want to maintain some independence and freedom. You know, why we do what we do now for, for my practice and myself is to be interested in people, not interesting to be relevant in their lives and to be encouraging. And so how we do that is hopefully if, as we're having this conversation, I'll be interested in you as much as you're showing an interest in me. When I go work with people this afternoon, I want to be interested in their life and I want to be relevant. And when I go to Clemson football, I want to be interested and relevant. But most importantly, when I go home tonight, I want to be relevant and interested and encouraging to my family. That's right. Now, how long did it take you to figure out this plan to, I mean, go back to school and, become a psychologist, get so, your PhD. So that just this doesn't is, happen overnight either. Uh, uh, no, I had, like I said, I had no idea how long it was going to take. So the funny part of the story is I had to go back and take, I started looking at grad school and they say, you don't even have enough undergraduate hours in psychology. You know, you got to go back and take gr- undergraduate classes. So I actually went to South Carolina, take 18 hours of undergraduate psychology, and they, they assigned me up for intro to psych. And so I get there and I meet with my advisor and they say, well, you've, you've already taken intro to psych. At Clemson, I'm like, really? I don't, I don't remember taking <laughs> don't that remember class. That. I think I was playing ball in the car. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. You were skipping yeah. those classes yeah. like what I did. What I make? They said you made a B. I'm like, is that good? They said, yeah. Okay, check that off. <laughs> so I was so far removed, yeah, from being a psychologist. And so it took. That was '97. I started taking undergraduate classes, and I did not start my practice. And I started that on my postdoc until 2005. Wow. Yeah. That long. Yes. Yeah, no idea it was going to take that long. But once, you know, once I made my mind up, I was Yo, like, you okay, were in. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to commit to it. So what was that whole process like then? So I had to go get, I had to finish that. I had a, I got a master's degree. Then I completed an educational specialist degree and then completed my PhD work at the University of Kentucky. And before you're able to get licensed as a psychologist, I had to do a year of pre-doctoral supervision. And then after that, I have to get a one-year postdoc. And that's when I started my practice. Yeah. So the fun part of the story for me in 98, I wrote a vision of, hey, here's what I think, here's what I'm going to do. And I wrote, I'm a, I'm a great husband and father. I wasn't married, didn't have children. You know, you're kind of skating, as, as Wayne Gretzky said, to where the puck is going instead of where <laughs> you right. are. <laughs> exactly. I, uh, I'm a respected psychologist and professor because I thought I would, have a, I would teach and have a practice in Greenville, just a party of one. I use my own life experiences and my faith and my education to encourage others and help others accomplish what they want to accomplish. And I make enough money to do the things in life I want to do them with the people I want to do them with. And that was your vision. That was it. I printed it in my mind. I didn't think about it. And then 2005, when I started my practice, it took me about three months to realize I was teaching a leadership class at Clemson and starting my practice that, man, this was put into place eight years ago, yeah, seven long years time ago. ago. So it's, Just it's been pretty neat uh, to kind of watch things come to life. Of course. Now, how did it kind of shift in terms of your practice? Now, you know, it's on the 
team performance side or the performance side of psychology yeah. in sports. Yeah. How, how did that happen? So when I was starting my practice, Terry Don Phillips created a position. He was the athletic director at Clemson for the director of sport performance. And I can't remember what else, wellness and performance. And Dr. Loretto Jackson was a primary candidate for that job. And I applied for that job, not thinking I could get it, not sure if I really wanted it. But in that interview, I presented a job of mental health and performance from a cognitive behavioral perspective, from a mindset, uh, from a psychological perspective. And he called me the next day and he said, Mild, I'm going to give the job to Loretto. She's just a much better candidate for, <laughs> for the job than you are. And he was absolutely right. But what you presented, we have nothing like that at Clemson. Would you be willing and to— And so what did you present then? Just um, we know that anxiety and depression rates are were doubling and tripling across college campuses and in young people. And so I, I kind of believe there's a holistic focus. It says in Proverbs, as you think, so you are. And so the skills we truly try to teach people are, are applicable in dealing with their mental health, but also in helping them perform, perform. at a higher level. And so what I tell our players today, if I just make you a better football player, I've completely failed you. So it was a holistic model looking at their mental and physical and spiritual and relational and emotional and behavioral health and said, here's how I want to help build this. And so when he called and told me he's given that job to Loretto, he said, would you be willing to come over here one day a week to start putting that into practice? And I was like, what day? Like, I got, I got yeah, nothing else. I've got I'm, it. I'm yes. teaching Tuesday, Thursday morning. Other than that, I'm good. <laughs> and so that started in 05. And the next year it went to 12 hours. And then when Coach Swinney was hired in 09, uh, I spoke with him and talked about how I could help the football team. And so in 2009, his first full year, uh, I started working with the football. And so it became two days a week. And it's been that way ever since. Um, and now I've got a couple other people that are helping me out over there. Now, I, I think that what you're talking about is this performance aspect. It, it crosses the sports barrier, right? I, I mean, it's so. yes. it's in your whole life, as you mentioned. If you're just training these guys just to be a better football player, then you're not doing your job and failing them because this whole performance thing and the anxiety and depression, it affects everybody no matter what they're doing. Yeah. Yeah, I think I presented a study at the time when I interviewed for that job that suggested that 90% of college student athletes are stressed and anxious about academics alone, much less finances, much less competing for national championships, much less being away from home, much less being the first person in your family to go to college. Like just about academics, they were experiencing significant levels of psychological distress. And I'm like, we've got to create a model that's able to help them deal with this in such a way so they can be who they were created to be and free to pursue their goals. Yeah, and even just maybe some of the things that they've experienced in life that's affecting them, going back to your story. Absolutely. Like with your mom. So did that resonate for you? Oh, absolutely. So Kentucky, what was a gift about going to Kentucky? It was a very trauma-based program. And so they really worked with people who had been through traumatic events and experiences. And I'm like, I don't want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Right? No, thank you. And, and there was no, it's just amazing. Like, like we laughed about immature and irresponsible in eighth grade. I was still naive about life, even at that age, with what I had been through. Because I'm like, no, I want to work with normal people with normal problems. <laughs> and I realized. I don't know if that's possible. <laughs> it's not. That we've all been through some form of trauma. And so the greatest training I've ever received is not sports psychology or anything else about going and dealing with people with traumatic events. And the most difficult part about being a dad or being a husband mm -hmm. or being a psychologist or being a friend is you can't take away somebody else's pain, but you can be present in the pain as they're dealing with it. And so that has helped me connect. And we've had some traumatic events throughout my time at Clemson. We've had traumatic events that have happened this, this past year to our football team. So understanding how mm -hmm. trauma affects us mentally and physically and spiritually and emotionally and relationally and seeing how I handled it and how I was running from the pain, I didn't have the courage to stand up to the pain. So when did you have that courage to stand up to the pain? Yeah, I think just through life. I think, you know, one of my favorite movies is Shawshank Redemption. Of course. And it's like you got to get busy living or get busy dying. 
and, and the beauty of my life are having people that force me to get back in the game. And so that competitive outlet of sports, uh, the competitive outlet of friends, um, they're trying to figure life out and going back on the farm and starting to think for yourself. Uh, I think I'm still figuring it out. I think I'm still figuring out how that pain hurts. We all are. Yes. Yes, without a doubt. It's, it's a constant process, so to speak. And I can tell you, Every time at the end of Shawshank Redemption, I cry. Yeah, uh, the yeah. beach scene. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, when Morgan I'm getting to watch it again up. tonight. I already told my son he's on break. I'm like, we're watching Shawshank before you go back to school. So <laughs> yes. I'm prepping myself for that tonight. Get ready. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So speaking of some of that pain though, and some of the adversity, how did your parents' divorce impact you? Well, especially after being married for 27 years. Yeah, and so obviously my lo- my mom goes through a life threatening situation, and it gives you a different perspective. And for 20 years, they had spent their life as my father worked, and it was revolved around children. And so my little brother was nine. His sports had not taken over our family yet. So I think they just wanted more out of life. But I'd always heard, hey, we don't believe in divorce. I mean, this is, this is we don't believe in it. And, and so when we divorced, I, I wasn't ready for that. Like, we don't believe in this. Yes, yeah, right. And I didn't understand it. And now I've been married for 20 years. I'm scared to say this on air, but like, I understand it. It's hard. It's <laughs> it difficult. Is. It's challenging. Marriage is hard. That's right. And so it really violated one of my core values. And and I realized I had a lot of pride mm-hmm. in thinking kind of who my family was. I had a lot of pride in who I thought I was. And so what it allowed me, I think I just God was humbling me through that process and like, look, man, this there's nothing special about you. There's nothing special about the louders. You're just like everybody else. And I think through that process of being humbled and developing perseverance and resilience, and I think I'm a better person for it. Yeah. And again, some of that adversity can shape you more than whatever success that we have. In yeah. Life. Can we learn from success? Can we learn from failure is what we try to really teach. Yeah. And so when you're talking with the, with the team, are you relating, as, as you mentioned, talking about, you know, trying to connect with them and have them identify with you. So are you, you know, um, somewhat pulling some of your experiences to help connect with those guys? Yeah. I, I think I try to be open and authentic, but man, like, the glory days of me playing intramural basketball, <laughs> like that doesn't carry a whole lot of weight when you've got the uh, the guys we've got in that room. They look at me, they're like, there's no way that guy could play sports. Um, and so... Well, they're mistaken uh, yeah. because I promise you, <laughs> y- you could. <laughs> um, but I try to share my life experiences. I mean, Coach Swinney's story is so powerful. Yeah. And so I try to open that up. And I actually told them that story this year on Thanksgiving about my parents' divorce. Okay. And and here's why Thanksgiving was challenging for me because that reminded me so much of my family experiences, open a day of quail season, just unbelievable experiences. And Thanksgiving every year, there's a little bit of sadness that I got to make a choice to let go yeah. so I can really enjoy it. And so I use those life experiences, but I try to make it so much more about them so they can apply it to their lives. Yeah. Now, when did faith become so important to you? Uh, faith has been a part of my life uh, for a long time. I remember my grandmother was really ill, and the book of James is her favorite uh, book. And it talks about be joyful when you face trials and tribulations because that develops perseverance, and perseverance develops wisdom. And so I think that's always been in my heart, um, and, I, and, I, and I think that just always has shaped my life. Now, I haven't always lived accordingly, <laughs> right? Like, like we all uh, fall short. Yeah. But I think that has always been my outlook. And what's been neat with me about psychology, it says in Proverbs, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. And so as you're hopefully gaining wisdom in life, you're able to see, well, a lot of these principles, you know, I believe were created, the man who created us, created how our brains work and how we think. Those principles uh-huh. apply whether you believe and have faith or not. That's right. Well, I didn't come into my faith until probably 11, 12 years ago, and it's been life-changing, you know, for me, well, especially as you have to go through adversity, yeah. and where can you get your strength? And, you know, I had uh, uh, a tragic situation 2014. My brother was shot and killed, and it was one of those type of moments where it really tested, wow. you know, my faith. And But it was because of my faith that helped me mm. 
get through it and be able to forgive, you know, yeah. and that's, that's a very hard thing to do. So, uh, you know, I, I, I look at certain people and like, man, I'm jealous that they've had such a strong faith foundation for so long relative to me, but everybody has their own yeah, journey, and right? And your own path. And yes. I think, I mean, you just mentioned forgiveness and it's part of when I told my story about that Thanksgiving is that um, I talk a lot about forgiveness and that forgiveness equals freedom. Of course, and big time. And the best definition I've heard, I think Lewis Mead says, forgiveness is where that person or that event doesn't control you. And so I use this a lot in my counseling, whether or not, and in my work, whether people have a faith or not. And they said, well, what does that look like? And I said, well, Jesus, somebody said, I think it was Peter, how many times should we forgive? Seven? He said, no, 70 times seven. That's right. And so what I tell people is every time I'm reminded of that event, every time I'm reminded of that pain, then I got to make the choice to let it go because it releases me. And we talk about we play our best when we play free. Even if I make a mistake, I can't control the last play. I have to be focused on the next play. That's right. And so speaking of free, you, you've got the, the acronym free. <laughs> yes. So explain yeah. how you came up with that. Oh, so I was working with Ben Martin. It was funny. In 2015, he, he's on the PGA Tour. He was getting back in the Masters. And I was going back over my notes. He had played in the Masters maybe with – uh, 2011, I, I got to go back and look at my notes. So he was there as an amateur or somebody was there. And I talked. To, I just talked about playing free. Yeah. And so around 2015, I really started saying, okay, what does that look like? How do, how do we bring that to life? And, you know, Coach Swinney probably has a big influence because <laughs> he creates acronyms. and He's got them all over got, the place. Yeah, yeah. And I so, want to know who his ghostwriter yeah, is. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. and so, um, so free, I kind of came up with it. It stands for focus, relax engage and enjoy. And so kind of that mindset, I have our team finish every year, hey, we play our best. And so to me, it's we play our best when we play free. And what does that mean? We're free to pr make mistakes. That's right. We're free to pursue worthy goals. We're free to dream big. We're free to be who God created us to be. And so with that freedom comes confidence. And so when you know who you are and what you believe and you're free to act accordingly, then, then, then what is there to really fear? And so we try to walk through these principles with the team and with people we work fit with on how to focus on the things you can't control, how to focus on being your best, how to focus on your vision, relax, it's how to quiet the mind and quiet the body. Slow down. Yeah. Right? Which is not my natural gift. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you do run 100 miles per hour. Yeah, yeah, I know it's it. not my natural uh, state. Uh, the engage is how to fully engage in, a, yeah. in the present moment, how to engage in a routine. And then the last part is how to enjoy the moment. And, and I think that's something that Coach Sweeney and the team really brought to life this year for the national championship. We enjoyed, and that was my prayer. I know that was Coach Sweeney's prayer and his word of, hey, we're just going to enjoy the moment. And I think when we're free of the burden of expectations, then we're free to enjoy the good and the bad. Yeah, and is there a particular area of that where you see people struggle more than others? In terms of, can they enjoy it or, you know, Well, I think you understand engaged. what keeps you, like, I think the burden of expectations keep us from enjoying it. That's right. And I, and I live that way. I told the staff not long ago in around 2015 or 16, like, I've been coming over here now for nine years. And I've acted the way I think a psychologist should act. And I don't even, like, like that's not who I am. And so I was trying to be stoic and steady. And so, you know, Coach Swinney with his permission and because when he's free to be who he is, then it frees me up to be who I am. And so yeah. I've allowed myself to get more emotional and enjoy it, not in a crazy way. I'm not a fan <laughs> uh, anymore. I'm a fan of the guys and the coaches. Um, and so just bringing that to life. So for me, it's been really focusing on joy because I know if I'm going to have a regret when I look back that I just didn't enjoy the experiences along the way. Yeah. But I've been so busy, which I think is a good thing. That's right. That, but, but you can have tunnel vision exactly, at times, right? To kind of step back and enjoy it. And so I spent a lot of time on like the basics of focus on what we can control and creating an image in our mind of who we want to be instead of who we don't want to be. And I think that's what focused to me really the vision that we want to bring to life is your brain is going to see to develop the most dominant picture that you paint with which you attach the most emotion. And so I really try to help people create a vision of who I am and who I want to be uh, and see it come to life. Of course. Now, as you talked about, you didn't want to see a psychologist when your mom was preaching that to you. 
So what about these players? What was that like first and foremost? I mean, were they like, wait a second, who's this, oh, who's this yeah. guy, and, Dr. Louder? I yeah, don't want to yeah, see a no, psychologist. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they know, no. And so, uh, you know, I remember one of the first players, I won't mention his name, I had my office over in Vickery and had a couch, and he walks in, he's like, Am I supposed to get like? Am I supposed to get on the couch? What am I supposed to like? <laughs> like people don't know what to expect. Yeah, exactly. And so I think part of that is just seeing myself as Milt and trying to be genuine and true and connected. And it also helps Coach Sweeney has completely bought in uh, to me and given me a platform, but also respected me in a way that says, "Hey, Milt's, Milt's not just here to help you with your problems. Milt's here to help all of us get better." and to help us be our best. And so then as you get some players start to buy in and you see hopefully some success, then other players, younger players. And so now I've been so embedded in the culture. It's just like, hey, this is is Milt. It's just part of it. It's just an extension of the team, right? Yes. And there's still some hesitation, as always, for some of our players. But most of our players understand my role and hopefully understand it's more about them than it is about me. Yeah. Now, moments with Milt. Yeah. I yeah. love those. <laughs> <laughs> so how did that, what was the genesis of coming up with that hashtag? I was and Coach just, Sweeney. It was. Yeah, it was Coach Sweeney. I didn't, it's not me. I wish I could take credit <laughs> for it. You know, he names everything. I love his creativity. I love his energy. And so in 2009, he got the first head coach, in, you know, he was a full-time head coach. He and I were talking. We hadn't kind of baked out what my role was going to be with the team. We had just got beat by Maryland. And he called me and said, hey, I think you need to come speak to our staff. We're struggling. So I walk in on a Wednesday morning. They're still game planning. And I ask them, hey, how do you define success? Which is one of my favorite questions to ask. And so we can talk about their their answers later and what that (laughs) came out. And so it started creating a conversation where every week after that, I started meeting with the coaches. And I would meet with Coach Sweeney, and then I would meet with the coaches and then it started where later on I was meeting with the team. And so since 2009, I've been meeting with the coaches and the team every week during the season. And I, maybe it was the fourth or fifth session. He was like, hey, what you got, Milt? You know, just, hey, just want Milt here to have a moment, you know, to speak to the team. He's like, moments with Milt. I kind of <laughs> like that. And so, like, so, hey, moment. So, so I get tickled. Most of the players sometimes don't even call me Milt. They'll just call me Moment. Hey, Moment. What's up, Moment? <laughs> and so that's just Coach Sweeney, kind of his brand of a moment with Milt. Of course. And, and now when you're, like, in, in those type of situations with the staff, with the players, how are you balancing to keep it where it's a conversation rather than – it's just, oh, there's a team psychologist telling you this is what you should be doing. Yeah, and so I kind of kind of try to stay off the shoulds, but what I like what I realized four or five years ago is our coaches pour so much into other people, like how can I pour into them? So they all, like when I first started, they were getting the same message. Like here's I hear the coaches is the same message in the team this afternoon. And so I've really tried to pour into the coaches the last four or five, six years to help them become better people. You know, we believe better people make better leaders, better leaders create better teams. And so I try to bring issues to life that are relevant, not only about great coaching, but about just kind of dealing with the stress and demands and connections. So this year we talked a lot about psychological safety. We talked about separating who they are from what they do. We talked about loving the player uh, while you may hate their play. Yeah. And so just some principles that I try to share from my own experiences and best practices about leadership. The team is, you know, 150 guys. And so it's not much of a conversation. It's Thursday afternoon. It's a 10 or 15 minute, uh, depending on what the, the focus is. And just trying to give them a nugget, just trying to give them a reminder, just trying to remind them of who they are, uh, what we want to focus on. And then on Fridays or Saturdays, I've had them all complete a sentence. I'm at my best when I play my best win. So I'll send out reminders. Um, the conversations take place, the one-offs, the individuals. Yes. Okay. Uh, but that's kind of what it looks like. Yeah, and when you uh, – so I guess the, the question is you talked about your definition of success, but do you also have somewhat of a definition that – for the team perspective of how these guys are, are growing through your help or how do you evaluate that? That's the hardest part to measure is that's the good and the bad also, right? Yeah. Nobody knows – kind of like I don't get a whole lot of credit, although, you know, Coach Swinney has been gracious, but I don't get a whole lot of blame, right? There's, <laughs> and so it's really hard to measure uh, an impact. And 
And so to me, it's just kind of having joy in the process and watching them grow in these different domains. So success to me is what I challenged one of the coaches. He said, well, Milt, success is winning, that first conversation in 2009. Because if we don't win, we get fired. That's, that's the reality of, of it. A lot of truth in that. And that's I started right. thinking, like do, like, do I challenge that? Do I not? Do I tell him the truth? And I finally remember sitting there and going, well, Coach Sweeney's not paying me not to tell the truth. So I look at the coach and said, Coach, if you can't control winning, why are you two and three? And it got really awkward. <laughs> and it got – and I'm like, it wasn't even a moment with Milt yet. I'm like, it wasn't. I'm, I'm right. one and done. I'm out. Like, they don't want to hear that. But I think it intrigued them enough to say, okay, well, well maybe, maybe this guy's right. And so we talk about success being the worthy pursuit of a worthy goal or where John Wooden said success is the peace of mind, which is a direct result of the self-satisfaction knowing you did your best to become the best you're capable of becoming. And so kind of framing for me is, hey, I know I'm giving them my best and I'm trying to help them become the best they're capable of becoming. And, and those are our goals. And so it's a lot at Clemson football now. It's not who we play, it's how we play. And we're just trying to create a better version of ourselves. We're trying to create a better version of our team. Uh, and I think we can see the fruits of that labor when we see our graduation rate. We can see who these young men are becoming. We can see the Paul journey and their um, internships and businesses. We can see Hunter Renfro talk this morning mm -hmm. in a way that's so authentic and genuine that represents who he is. And being a part of their growth, whatever role that is, that's right. Just, just happy and 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 lucky to be a part of it. Yeah. Well, I, I can tell you from being involved in the Paul journey, I'm blown away by the character mm. of these student athletes, and obviously, some of it's DNA that Coach Sweeney and the staff recruiting guys yeah. with high character. Yes, and absolutely. I think that's probably the most important thing. But I look at some of these guys, and I'm like, man. When I was 20 years old, I was not like that. No. Right? No. It's completely different no, than I what I envisioned myself. I have such a respect for them and their discipline and their focus and their love for each other yeah. and their love for the game and their willingness to sacrifice um, to create something special. Agreed. And it's and, and then the and the men that we have and, and all the coaches at Clemson amaze me in terms of every program we've got of who they are and what they represent, the men and women that, that pour in to these young people and the staff. Uh, it's just it's just neat yeah. to watch and be a part of. And so every little you know, the difference is in the little things. And so I admire Terry Don Phillips and Dan Radakovich and Coach Sweeney and the rest of the coaches for having the vision of how can we help them develop and grow in every aspect of their life. Yeah. Now, is it any different between sports? You work with football and basketball or any of the other sports? Or yeah, you, so now still... I'm kind of football, basketball, uh, kind of men's golf, men's soccer is my teamwork. We have a, a once-a-month head coaches leadership academy, trying to take that moment with Milt that we've done with the football coaches and – uh, working on the culture and the language and the mindset and, and, again, helping these coaches be their best, right? Because the higher up you go and as a coach, you're pouring so much into other people, but nobody's looking out for you. So I'm trying to play that role. There are differences. Obviously, our golfers have a different mindset than our D-line. Yeah, of um, course. Our basketball team with 10 to 12 guys uh, can be a more intimate conversation in those in those team meetings. But the fundamental principles, what we try to say, here are the principles we believe in, the fundamentals of a growth mindset. But for you as a team and for you as an individual, you have to figure out, hey, what does it mean? What does it mean to you? And what are you going to do with that information? Because I tell them, it's not my mental game, right? I've got mine, right? <laughs> <laughs> right? right? I've, I've got mine. Yes. This your mental game, yeah, right? It's not my team, it's your team. And so what you do with it uh, is up to you. It's your, you got to take ownership of the process. Yeah. And you talk about growth mindset and podcast here, but you've got the growth podcast. We, oh yeah, oh yeah, yes. yeah, yeah, so, yeah. Got a little growth project. Yeah. Yes, exactly. The growth project. So give me the, the details on that. So, so growth mindset is from a theory of motivation called achievement goal theory. Kind of, kind of why do we do what we do? And this growth mindset is really looking about how do we talk, how do we define success? And it's the pursuit of a worthy goal where success is not final, failure is not fatal unless you allow it to be. And the number one characteristic of a growth mindset is you believe your efforts are going to equal success. 
And so it's, I'm not comparing myself to you. As Tiger, Tiger Woods, you say, I'm trying to be the best that I can be. That's right. Hopefully that's going to be the best ever. And so we've kind of created that in the growth project and at Clemson football and in where we work is let's just focus on being the best that we can be. Let's do these common things in an uncommon way. Let's view mistakes as a chance to get better. Let's crave feedback. Because when I focus on the things I can control, it increases my confidence and decreases my anxiety. That's what we're trying to create. Versus a fixed mindset is now I'm comparing myself to you. Mm-hmm. And I can't control how big you are, how strong you are, <laughs> how fast you are, your knowledge, your skill set. And so now my anxiety increases and my confidence decreases. So the growth project is just a way of trying to be relevant and communicate a message and lessons from people like you um, who have who are sharing stories and experiences to help other people get better. Yeah, you enjoying that? I, I, yeah, I love it. I, you know, <laughs> it's funny. I kind of get in a rhythm and I get away from <laughs> That's it. That's right. <laughs> um, and as that you can, can happen. Tell, yeah. And so to me, I love to learn yeah. and, and giving people a chance and learning from people with their story. And, and if you're trying to be relevant, that's kind of why we're doing it. Um, cause we believe in what we do and, and we believe that, Hey, we've seen this work. How can we give that to other people? That's right. Same thing you're doing with yes, your podcast. sharing the content. Exactly. Of course. I'm always fascinated, though, just the power of the brain. Yeah. I mean, so from your perspective, I mean, I, I, it's hard for me to comprehend what the brain can do. So from your side of things, just how do you relate that to these mindsets, just what the brain can do and how it can control in a good way or a bad way. Oh, absolutely. And so, as I said earlier, your brain's going to seek to develop the most dominant picture that you paint with which you attach the most emotion. One of our strongest emotions is fear. And so our brain was really created, our sympathetic nervous system was created to protect us from threats. And so usually our brain is seeking to protect us and that fear paints that picture of who we don't want to be. And so was it Confucius who said originally, the man who thinks he can and the man who thinks he cannot are both correct? Oh, that's right. But Tom Kite said positive thoughts don't guarantee positive results, but negative thoughts guarantee negative results. And so what we try to do is get our brains working for us instead of against us. And so we develop these automatic negative thoughts that happen in our subconscious that we aren't even aware of, that set limits on who we are, sets limits on our efforts, sets limits on what we can accomplish. And so we really try to help people become aware of how are my my thoughts working for me or against me? And then as Einstein said, the same kind of thinking that creates your problems cannot be the same kind of thinking that creates your solutions. So how can I think differently in terms of here's what I can do, here's what I'm going to do, here's what I will do, Versus what I need to do, have to do, should do, or can't do. How difficult is that, though, to get people to have that shift in their mind? Oh, it's really difficult because it's ingrained in who we are. I mean, if you pay attention to your own language, if your listeners pay attention, how many times throughout the day are you saying, here's what I need to do, here's what I have to do, right? And that's like like Deshaun, right? This is a great example. We're playing Alabama first national championship. They had beat us the year before in an epic game out in Scottsdale. Unbelievable game. We're down in Tampa. We've got the lead. We've battled back. Unbelievable odds. And Jalen Hurts scores with two minutes to go. And we've seen this picture before. We have. And Clemson Nation, the Especially world. Especially Clemson Nation. Yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah. <laughs> the world is saying we have to go score. We need to go score. Well, when I need to do something, it adds anxiety and takes me farther away from what I'm trying to accomplish. But Deshaun's first thought was they left me too much time. And so he naturally saw the world in a different way. So if I go out there going, we have to score, we need to score, that's adding pressure and anxiety to the moment I'm not going to be at my best, I'm not going to be free. But imagine if I think about it, they left me too much time. So now I'm free. So then he gets everybody in the huddle and goes, let's be legendary. So now we're playing to win instead of playing not to lose. Of course. All in that one little thought pattern. Because when I have to do something, that just takes me farther away from it. And are there certain type of things that people can do to work on that? Because I imagine it's an exercise that you have to work on. Yeah, that's a 
that's the coolest part of the mental game. You can work on that all day long. Like when you go home when your kids are crying, right? <laughs> oh, you yes, gotta, that's you, right. I used to have to drive through the park on the way home and it's like, okay, who do I want to be when I walk in the door? Because this is going to be chaos. <laughs> and so the mental game you can work on all the time. And so we believe it's a process of as we raise your awareness, right, of what's working for you, what's not working for you, how are your thought patterns affecting your life? The action step is how are you changing the way you think? Right? How can you look at it in a different way? And the accountability is holding yourself accountable to who you are and what you believe because that's where freedom and power and confidence come from. And so I would challenge your listeners to say, okay, what's, like, how, what am I thinking? How are my thoughts working for me? How do we raise my awareness? What's my first reaction when I face a challenge or a setback or an opportunity? And if I can't change a situation, then I can only change how I think about yeah. it. And you've, I, you and I have both had to do that in, in traumatic experiences right. in our life. We can't go back and change the trauma, but we can only change how we think about it moving forward. And that's hard, though. It's really hard. It is. And, and you've got to have a support system in place as well because what I've felt that I've learned also, I can't do it by myself. No. No, that's the beauty of life. And, and it's what we tell people we work with and what I know in my own life. I wouldn't be here without so many people who have loved me mm-hmm. and supported me and been there for me and challenged me and heard me uh, and encouraged me. And, and you can't do it by yourself. No. And so, and, and so that's the beauty of life. That's yeah. the beauty of this, of, of working with a team as well. Yeah. And people pushing you. Yeah. It doesn't do well. like, like it doesn't do you any good for you to go get a great mental game. Like, and you have a great, and, and you don't help anybody else along the way. Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah. And so that's that's what's fun to be a part of these young people who they aren't playing for themselves, they're playing for something greater than themselves. Yeah. How 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 does that feel when you can see somebody uh like a Deshaun in that situation, knowing that you were part of the the whole equation of helping this team and so how much <laughs> joy do you have when you see some of the success and and maybe it's not from a win or loss type of situation. But when you see some of these guys that, you know, somewhat mature or, you know, have a different mindset. Yeah, I think I think to me my, one of the greatest parts of my job is to watch these young men and these coaches experience the joy, yeah. right? Because the grind, they work so hard. And so it's such a privilege to be able to witness pure joy in its finest form and have someone set a goal and go achieve it. Now, it's very humbling to think you've been a part of that. Mm -hmm. And I've had to get comfortable to acknowledge that maybe I have helped some of these young men along the way and some people along the way. And so I've had to get comfortable to think I've played a part. How do you measure that? I don't know. What does it look like? Um, But I've been completely blessed in my work with opportunities and privileged to work with some remarkable people in all walks of life. And so for me, the joy comes in hopefully being able to use the gifts I have to encourage people along the way. And that it's as meaningful to me when they reach out to me to celebrate a success as they do to have some help through a difficult time. Could you have ever imagined that you would be in the position that you (laughs) are now? No, Coach Swinney played a a clip from T.D. Jakes, who is a, uh, a evangelical preacher and just a powerful presence. And in the clip, and he talks about, have you ever been in a situation where it just doesn't make sense? Yeah. Like, just, like, for you to be where you are and have the opportunity, it just doesn't make sense. (laughs) And people have criticized you, and people have laughed at you, and people have said things, and he played this for a team, and it just doesn't make sense, he said, but it worked. And so all through the playoffs, whenever I would see Coach Swinney, I was like, you know, Coach, it just doesn't make sense. <laughs> like, it just doesn't make sense that I'm here. You know, he's like, it doesn't make sense that I'm here. And he would look back at me and goes, but it worked. That's right. And so, no, I, you know, we believe, as I said earlier, success comes to those who are too busy to be looking for it. And so if I step back and look where I am, I never – you know, my, my first vision was to have a little private practice yeah. and see 20 people it's a week. completely different. And teach at Clemson. And we changed the vision about 10 years ago, and that's come to life. But I never even dreamed uh, to have some of these opportunities. Well, I'm also just jealous of how you can remember all of these <laughs> quotes and phrases and all of that. Because I love 
these what I call words of wisdom. Yeah. And, you know, so I, I'm big on that. I just can't remember them like yeah. you. Well, I, I, I laugh. <laughs> I always thought if you can't come up with an original idea, you better have a good memory. And uh, Well, you've got yeah. it. I'm telling you. And you... My, my, our friends in college used to call me Mr. Short-Term Memory because I could cram for anything. That was the way I studied. Yeah. yeah. Just give me some note cards. Let me memorize. Which is why organic grade. chemistry didn't work in calculus. <laughs> no. I, could, I could not cram for those things. <laughs> That's right. So speaking of that, uh, words of wisdom, you, you've shared a ton. But are there any other ones that mean a lot to you? Man, I, you know, there's so many that I think I try to ascribe to mm-hmm. uh, and believe in. Um, frame it for me. Just in terms of um, if you're looking at, if there's a motto for Milt Louder's life, what what is something that is a foundational principle that you lean on uh, to maybe get through certain things, mm. whether good or bad. There, for me, it's a couple of Bible verses, if that's okay to share. Of course. I think I probably have already shared some now that I'm asking permission. <laughs> um, so Hebrews 11.1 1 says, Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. And so to me, the hope that comes from that, of sure of what I hope for, certain of what I do not see, and then James 1.12 was a verse that has brought great meaning to me and to people in my life, uh, and it's something that I go to, and it says, Blessed is a man who perseveres under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will see the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. And so to me, that just helps me remain steadfast and persevere That's right. Uh, through the good and the bad. Keep fighting that good Keep fight. Keep fighting the fight. Right. Right. Yes. So um, that, that the purpose of that parenting class you know, God doesn't care if your children like you yeah. means, okay, hopefully if I get to heaven, God's going to say, hey, did you do the best with what I gave you? That's right. And Were you a good steward, right? Yeah, and that's how I want to be. <laughs> I want to I want to give it everything I've got, and I want to encourage other people to do the same. Of course. Well, you're building a legacy. There is no <laughs> doubt about that. <laughs> One way or the other. I'll, that's right. I was good or bad. That's, that's kind of you. No. What happened to the finger here? I, I got, see. Is this, is this some yeah, pickup basketball? Yeah. No, I wish it was. I do... Um, I do remember myself probably being a little bit more athletic than I was. So we went snow skiing with the, with the coaching staff out in Colorado. And uh, and I've only been about eight or nine times, so I'm not great. But the last day I saw this run, a double run through the blacks, the title was Forget About It. Like, like don't even think about it. <laughs> you just got to go. I got to go. And I looked, at the, be gr- free. I, I looked at the group I was with and my wife was with us like, like I'm in. And, and uh, they said, you're crazy. I'm like, no, I, I think I can do this. And it was an unbelievable run, and my wrist caught a tree, and, and, I, and I got off balance and, and uh, put my hand up pretty fast. And so I broke my hand here. I tore this uh, ligament here. And the worst part is my wife was upset with me. And she said, you know, when are you going to grow up? <laughs> and I said, I'm not. Never. Because part of my personality, as you're just talking about, is I'm always going to embrace the challenge. Like, I think I, I, like if I go back there again, I'm, I'm going to do it again. And so that's how I want to be. Not reckless. Of course. Um, but I always want to see. But you like facing those challenges. Yeah, I want to see what I'm made of and, and see if I, and I couldn't like this, the, the course <laughs> one that time. But uh, we'll give it a go next time. When's the last time you played some pickup ball? Oh, man, I, my son um, is getting pretty good. He's around 15. And so I haven't played with the guys. I hurt my back a couple years ago. See, this, this, Age thing yeah, gets I don't in the like way, it. right? I don't like it. But he, he likes to run his mouth every now and then. Oh, okay. And so we've we've had some great battles. He actually beat me for the first time last year to step back three in my face, kind of ran his mouth a little bit, and he didn't score the next three games. So, <laughs> <laughs> so here you so go, son. I can still I still tell him I can take it a notch you don't even know about. But <laughs> but he's right. grown about four inches this year. I don't I haven't tried him in a while. Okay. Well, How about you? No, nah, it's it's been a while because it's it's the whole age thing. Yeah. It's is it going to be a hamstring that I'm going to pull, or is yeah. it going to be something that it hurt, or I'm going to be sore for the next three weeks, you know, because of that? Uh, but I, I try to live vicariously yeah. through. We need to get the kids. old guys. I can I play know. with those, like That's all right. the old guys in the quad. Let's get all the old fraternities and <laughs> because the quad, you didn't have to run far. <laughs> no, no, you were boxed in, right? Exactly. You just stayed right there. Exactly. Well, Milt, 
Thank you so much. Oh, what a blessing, man. It's been an honor, and I greatly appreciate you spending some time. Yeah, thanks Thank for having you. me. That was a treat. Yes, sir. Beautiful.